Did it turn on? <laughs> Is it working? That goes too far. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to God. Is that it? Okay. You can turn the phone down. Turn the what down? The phone I already did. I told you Jesus did it. I'm calling with it.
saying tonight may not be the funniest message you've ever heard. This is going to be one that may challenge you <coughs> that you've been pondering lately in the Word. But, well, I'll get to it in a minute. But if you listen to me, you can save your walk with God. It's that serious we're going to get into. So it's, it's for reproof for correction. The world will correct you. And I'm not here, I'm not here to correct anybody. That's not the purpose. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna condemn anybody tonight. We're gonna talk about a doctor that's been creeping through the body of Christ. That is a cancer uh, to the true truths of the scripture. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I want to be completely equipped by God to do his work. Amen. How about you? Amen. Then he goes down into chapter 4 and in verse 1 he says. He writing to Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. What does it mean to be instant in season and out of season? <coughs> it means when you feel like it and when you don't. You follow me? Sometimes, sometimes I, I tell you what, there's been days I said, Patty, I don't want to go to church tonight. Well, I didn't say it. I thought it. I don't think I want to go tonight. And uh, then I realized, well, I'm preaching. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to do what God wants you to do, whether you feel like it at the moment or not, right? Mm -hmm. Reprove. There's the, now, see, this. he's talking to Timothy, who was a pastor. Reprove. In other words, correct. Rebuke. And exhort. It's amazing that God has two statements of correction before he gets to one of exhortation. Y'all are still quiet in here. <laughs> Amen. You're concerned about what I'm going to say, aren't you? <laughs> Keep your toes out there, you'll be safe. He says, We're proving our beauty. There's two corrective statements before there's one about exhortation. But we live in a day in a microwave generation where everybody always just wants exhortation. Oh, prophesy good things over me. Don't tell me what I really need to hear. Do you follow me on that? Yeah. And as a pastor, I'm assigned to bring both the good and the bad. Now, let me, let me make this clear. What I'm speaking to you tonight, I've already been teaching in my church, so it's not like I'm coming to pick on the Pekin Church. <laughs> Amen? In fact, wherever I went right now, I would be probably speaking this message, and I'll explain that again in a second. Let's read on. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come. Say that's now. now. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to them those teachers having itching ears. We now live in a generation in a time frame where there's a church on every street corner and usually two or three in between. And people can choose the church they want to go to based on how it makes them feel. Rather than whether it's the truth or not. And I want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. And so 15 days ago, this is Saturday night, and all my prayer 15 days ago is actually the, the Saturday, late Friday night. It was actually Saturday before Resurrection Day. And I already had my, my Resurrection Day. I don't like to say Easter. You know, you understand that, right? <laughs> And uh, I had my Resurrection Day message prepared. It was all about the illegal trial of Jesus uh, that, that, that took place. It was going to be a really good, rousing message. And at prayer, I'm, I'm just praying that God interrupt me. He says, I don't want you to, I don't want you to teach it something more. There's something more serious I need you to address. He said, there's a doctrine going through the body of Christ, which I'm well aware of, called uh, the New Grace Message. Uh, the Grace uh, What's the word they use? Revolution. Grace revelation, grace revolution. Uh, that's not a, not aligned with the word. You're okay with this, right? Okay. If you were teaching it, I was going to back off a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to have fun whether you smile or not tonight. Okay? <laughs> he said it's spreading through the body of Christ like a cancer. I want you to warn your people about it. So I'm not here to correct anything. I'm here to warn you of something and try to show you how it will try to sneak into your, into your own personal revelation of the Word. But yet it's about 
10 degrees out of line with the word, and if you stay on that course, you will miss the mark. Do you follow me on that? Yeah. Now what the doctrine declares is that once you're saved, how many know at the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Amen. Mm -hmm. And how many know as well, we're not going to go through these basic scriptures, but it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Yeah. Old things are passed away, build, all things have become new. You're a new creation in Christ. It says he has made him. Father God has made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, we understand through the cross, we are made new creations. We've been rebirth righteous. I used to be a sinner, but now that I'm saved, I am now a saint. You're used to that, right? Amen. See, I can't say that in some churches, but here, it's safe. Glad we got through that one. <laughs> We've been made new creations. We've been delivered from sin on the inside. God rebirthed your spirit wholly, rebirthed it with his own divine nature. But how many of you still have that same old flesh that you had before? You still have the same unredeemed mind that you had before. Amen. But on the inside, we've been made righteous. And as far as God's concerned, if we're in right standing with him, we are without spot or wrinkle. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Because we've been made righteous, we have free access to come boldly before the throne of grace and bring to God our petitions, right? Right. We can fellowship with God, the creator of the universe, through this right standing with Him. And we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're all in agreement with that, right? Amen. Now, that becomes much of the foundation for this, I call it hybrid grace. Tonight, you know, I've been asked a few times what the name is. This message. So I'm naming the title of this tonight Ludicrous Grace. <laughs> Amen. Let me give you a hint where we're going. Any revelation of grace you have that makes it easier to sin is not the genuine grace God intended for us to walk in. Yes, Do you follow me? Yes. Yet there's a new message being proclaimed that now that you've been saved, you've been made righteous, all true. God can no longer see your sin. Have you heard this before? It declares God can no longer see your sin. He will never ever again convict you of sin because you are already one of his children in right standing with him. Well, when I first heard this, in fact, I read the textbook on it probably about eight years ago. And I read that by a well-known individual. He's the leader of this movement in the world. And he wrote his book uh, on it. And I thought, if God can't see my sin, how many of the Holy Spirit's one third of the God yet? I've been hearing the wrong voice for 33 years. At the time, I've only been about 25. I've been hearing the wrong voice because God's always telling me what I'm doing wrong. I don't know about you, but because I, I like to stay in right standing with God, He's always reminding me of what I just messed up. And having me repeatedly apologize to my wife, even when I was right. <laughs> if God can't see your sin, then how can he reprove or rebuke us? You follow me on that? If God can't see our sin, how can he change us and take us from faith to faith and glory to glory? God is not focused on our sin. He's focused on delivering us from it. Do you follow me on that? Yes. So, this, let me explain some more about this revelation. They say, first of all, at the cross, everything was finished. And now we've been delivered from sin and God can't see it anymore. So if you were ever convicted of any sin in your life, it's not God, it must be the devil. Mm -hmm. Or your own soul convicting you. Because God can't see it. Well, I serve a mighty God. Yeah. Do you follow me? Yes. And, and I believe he doesn't miss anything. And this doctrine does not line up with the word. So they tell their people, no matter what you do, you're in right standing with God. So what do people do? Whatever they feel like. Doing. And I've heard well-known men of God proclaim that you can go out and you can be involved in homosexuality. You can be involved in, home, in, in, in fornication. You can do whatever. And, and, as long, and as long as you believe Jesus is Lord and you've accepted him as your Savior, you're going to heaven and it's going to be okay. 
I've even heard a pastor declare, well known, I'm not going to name names tonight, I hope, try not to, declare he could go out and sleep around this week if he wanted to and step right behind the pulpit the next Sunday and be right with God. He would just miss out on some rewards because he didn't follow God forward. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the doctrine that tells people you can stay the same as you've always been and never allow God to really transform you and actually be in right standing with Him. Now listen, none of us are going to be perfect with this. We all have quiet. <laughs> We're not going to do this perfect. But we do have to pursue after following God. I asked the Lord many years ago, where is the point that if we're allowing sin to, you know, operate in our life, where's the place where we lose out with you? Because I believe you can lose out with God. In fact, we won't have the time to go there tonight, but I've probably 50 verses out of the scriptures that let us know we can miss it with God. We can lose out. Amen? Amen. And I want to know, where's the point that, you know, because we're all going to sin, we're all going to, we're all going to make mistakes. Where's the place where we've sinned so bad? That we lose that. And I think there are some sins that are really dangerous for you to commit. You follow me on that? All sins are not the same. Amen. You cannot tell me when I would eat that sixth donut when God said, don't stop. You know, you say, stop at five. <laughs> <laughs> that that's the same as if I went out and killed somebody. Amen. You follow me? The Bible says there's a sin unto death. That means there must be sins not unto death. There must be levels of sin. But I want to know, God, where's the break point? Because I know you can kill somebody and repent and still get to heaven. They don't plan on it. They say, well, I'll repent later. That's called intentional sin. And I'm not sure it all works like you think it maybe does. If we sin willfully after we've gained knowledge of the truth, there remain no other sacrifice, the Lord says. And so where's the break point? So I want to get to that right now just to let you know what I think it is. So turn to Romans. I don't want to be somebody who's after just having my ears tickled. Now again, Patty shared in the women's meeting today. Didn't she do a good job? Yes. Yes. I was so proud of her. In fact, I told her this afternoon, I said, well, you, you settle it now. You're ready to preach in Georgetown. <laughs> No excuses now. I can't do that. Well, I, now I know you can. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't remember what I was going to say now. <laughs> What's that? I know I'm at. <laughs> That's my help me right there. That's my help me. Well, let's go to Romans 8. We'll come to me. Verse, oh, I remember now. See, I knew it come to me. She mentioned this afternoon when I was saved, I was on fire for God. Which is true. The night I got saved, I got delivered instantly from 12 years of alcoholism. 10 years of recreational drug use. Every desire I ever had, I ran the bars for years. Every desire I ever had for any other woman was put on my wife. And now we've been married 33 years. I've never desired anybody but her. And God did a real Amen. And from that moment, I started devouring the word. God, God spoke to me. I, I feel like it in me. He says, if you want to know me, read my word. And I would spend probably anywhere from four to eight hours a day in the word. I'd come home. She became a Bible widow. <laughs> because she'd be out there, you know, watching her, her, her garbage TV shows. <laughs> I'd tell you going to hell if you don't stop that. I'd go to bed and I'd shut the door and I'd read the word for about eight hours. I mean, from the time I got home from work until time to go to bed and then beyond. Devouring the Word. So I, I'm, I'm a student of the Word of God. Amen. What we teach has to line up with the Word or I don't want it. Amen? Amen. 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 And so it says that in Romans chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. I'm after that. How many, how many want to live in no condemnation? Amen. No condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? Yes. If you're in Christ Jesus, hey, you're in good shape because it says there's no condemnation. 
Praise God, no condemnation. And where the hyper grace people stop, they stop right there. But it goes on and it says, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Let me explain something else. Early on in, in, my, in my Christian walk, actually, for probably the first 10 years, I fought condemnation all the time. I, I, I was after God with everything I had, but if I was going fast, I broke it. Maybe, you know, uh, I was going to fast for 40 days, but only made it 30, I'd beat myself up. You couldn't even fast for 40 days. Or, you know, maybe I'd, I'd get, there, I remember a time I was on a long fast, and, and I was water only. I didn't weigh anything at the time. I was actually about 80 pounds lighter than I am right now. And, uh, which is not too long to do, I guess. <laughs> Somebody should have said, oh, I can't imagine. <laughs>
we're telling people walking in right standing with God, maintaining salvation is a whole lot easier than maybe it, it really is. Do you follow me on that? Mm -hmm. If you confess Jesus and you believe in your heart he was raised from the dead, are you saved? Yes. But now you have a responsibility to walk in the revelation of the word of God. Is this okay with you so far? Amen. Uh, so they say it's finished, and then and they tell you, because there's so many, how many of the Old Testament is full of commands to follow God or else? Right. So the adherence of destined to reign would be the book, the textbook of it. Destined to reign. The, the adherence declare, well, don't read the Old Testament. It's full of condemnation. I'm not under condemnation anymore. Why did God give us the Old Testament if we're not supposed to read it? Well, he made a mistake. God has made, made us a mistake. And he wrote that and he changed his mind. And now, you know, we don't need that anymore. The New Testament clearly declares that we should read both the Old and the New for our benefit, right? Yes. Then they say, don't read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, the statement is, don't read the red. What? I've told people for years to focus on the red. <laughs> you know, somebody's new to say this, so what I read, just start reading the red. I mean, if anybody you want to hear what they have to say, let's see what Jesus has to say. Because Jesus repeatedly declared, you'll lose out if you do certain things. Yeah. Where the weeping and gnashing of teeth. They say, don't read the red. So that leaves you with now 23 books left in the New Testament. Because we just took four of them out. Then they said, well, don't read those sections either because those were really written to the church. They're written to unbelievers, which is, in those cases, not even true. So they've narrowed down their doctrine to just a few verses that you can study. Hmm. Including 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21. You can read those. The rest of it, be careful because it could cause you not to understand who you really are in Christ. I want the whole word. Now, can I take this a step further? Amen. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. I'm saying it's because this doctrine is sneaky. And it creeps in. Remind me in just a minute. You guys help me remember something, okay? Remind me to tell you the, the steps that lead to people receiving this doctrine. I want, to, I want to teach these steps to you so you'll know when it comes your way how to avoid it. Okay? Or if you've heard it and have bought into part of it, I want to tell you why there's an error there. In Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus in chapter 1 had a visitation with John. Right, John the Beloved? And he said, I want you to write seven letters to seven churches, one letter apiece. Amen. Amen. And chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation are these seven letters. Now, I've studied these seven letters uh, quite intently, intensely. And I discovered of the seven letters, four letters were extreme warnings to the churches. In fact, look at the church of Sardis, the first one here. I don't want to read the whole letter. Let's go down to verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. I never want to be guilty of that one. How about you? Mm -hmm. To settle for religion instead of relationship. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, repent. And do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly. I will remove thy candlestick out of this place except thou repent. And here's another thing. Hyper Grace often says you don't have to repent anymore. <coughs> what do you have to repent from? God can't see it. But here he says... Either you repent, which means to turn away from. It doesn't mean to cry and feel bad, but it means to turn away from. He said, unless you repent, you're going to lose your candlestick. In other words, you're standing, your light, your position. In fact, of the seven churches, four were told they better fix some things. Two were commended. And one was somewhat neutral. It went both ways. Now, remember we read a while ago where it said the word of God is profitable? And we discovered that, that Paul told Timothy to rebuke and reprove and exhort. It's interesting, out of the six churches that weren't neutral, 
Four were in trouble, two were okay. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. I personally believe in America today, it'd be more like 95% of the churches would be in trouble. Do you follow me on this? So he said, you need to be careful what you're doing. So he's telling that here's Jesus. Now, how many of Jesus is God? If Jesus, if God and Jesus can't see our sin, how could he see anything to correct these churches for? That's right, amen. How could he tell them even what they need to correct if God can't see it? There's something wrong with this doctrine that people are buying into it like crazy. I'll tell you why here in a few minutes. He goes on and he says, <coughs> go, to the, go to the next. Well, that was the church at Ephesus. I told you it was the wrong church a while ago, didn't I? Uh, go to verse number 6, chapter 2, verse 6. Chapter 2, verse 6, yeah. For this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now that, that's mentioned twice. It's also mentioned over in verse 15 with the church of Pergamos that God hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. In fact, in verse 15, he says, I hate their doctrine. And he says, you hate that doctrine, I hate that doctrine. Well, I want to know if God hates a doctrine, what is the doctrine? What is the church of the Nicolaitans? Do you follow me? And so I did some study and I discovered that the church of the Nicolaitans was named after Nicholas. Does anybody know who Nicholas was? Nicholas was one of the seven deacons ordained of the, of the apostles in Acts chapter 6. Remember Stephen? Yeah. Philip? Deacons? Well, one of them mentioned was Nicholas. And Nicholas fell away from the truth, began at his own sect of teaching, calling themselves a church, but yet they started their own branch of Christianity that God said, I hate it. And what the Nicolaitans taught, if you study it out, you'll find they taught, they taught that once you're saved, God can no longer see your sin. This is not a new grace message. It's 2,000 years old. It was rampant back in the days of Christ, back in the days of the apostles. The day you know, the first century church. The Nicolaitans actually taught you could commit fornication and it's okay because God can't see it. If I understand right, they got caught up in even wife sharing, other activities. For most Christians think that's so heinous, but yet they bought into this thing because God can't see it anymore. You see this? And God said, I hate that God. And here's something else interesting uh, that I find interesting. He wrote letters to seven churches, right? Emphasis, Sardis, Pergamos, Laodicea, we could go through them. And for the, for the letters, some of them carried some, some extreme warnings to that church to fix some things. But there is no letter to the church of the Nicolaitans. God did not consider these inheritors, inheritors of this doctrine, even Christians. Don't get quiet again. See, I'm gonna say some, I'm gonna say some serious things, maybe extreme. Hope you'll forgive me if, if, if you think I'm going overboard. But these churches are springing up everywhere. New grace, this grace, that grace, grace kingdom. And and personally, I'm not sure God considers them, considers them churches. Because the doctrine is so far out of bounds of what the entire world declares, I believe they're already uh, many, many, many of these churches may not even be in right standing with God whatsoever. Because apparently the church of Nicolaita didn't even merit a letter of, of warning from Jesus. Do you see this? Let me explain how this doctrine, because I told you to remind me so you don't have to now because I remember. <laughs> How does this doctrine come about? Here is the logic that is used. First of all, we mentioned, if anybody confesses Jesus Christ, we're saved, right? Does anybody have a problem with that? You believe and you confess, you're saved. The word also says once you're saved and you confess Jesus, you are now made righteous. I have zero problems with why it aligns with the word. Do you follow me? Amen. Born again, word. Righteous, word. 
The next step. Once you were born again, the scripture makes it clear you are now a son of God. Back in 1 John 3, 1 and 2 declares you are now sons of God through Christ Jesus. Now are you sons, right? I'm a son of God because I've been born again. Do you agree with that? Amen. Scripture. Step four. And what loving father would ever turn his back on a son of his that maybe started to go astray? I know as a father, if my kids mess up, I'm still going to love them. Do you follow me on that? Do you have a problem with that? No. I do. There's no scripture that backs it up. There is no verse that says that God will not turn his back on any of his sons. He decided to leave the father himself. In fact, remember the story of the, of the, of the prodigal son? It's an example of the love of God for us. But the father said as long as the son was gone, he was dead. It wasn't until he came back he came into right standing again. I can show you, as I said, at least 50 verses of Scripture that tell you that once you're born again, you can still lose out with God. You can be a son and then become a prodigal son or even removed from the family. I just can't believe God would do that. Well, why don't we go with the Lord? Now, I want to, I want to go through that, those steps again so you follow them up because they're going to suffer you. I suffer you into it easily. Amen. <laughs> Confess Jesus, you're born again. Yes. It's in the Word. If you're born again, you're made righteous. Yes, it's in the Word. If you've been made righteous, you're now Son of God. Yes, it's in the Word. And now that you're a Son of God, God will never turn away from you. It's not in the Word. Is, it, is this okay? Am I getting too far out there? I don't know. I don't know. It's not in the Word. In fact, we're, let's go let's look at some verses. Go to Jude. I believe Jude is written right before the book of Revelation, letting us know it's something we'll deal with in the very end times. You follow me on that? Mm -hmm. Jude chapter 1, verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. How many of Jude was Jesus' brother? Half brother, right? Mm -hmm. And the brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Contend for it. Earnestly contend. In other words, it can't be anything. Goes. There's a doctrine that has to be guarded. And then he says, verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares. They're sneaky. Their words are sly. Who were before old ordained in this condemnation, <coughs> Ungodly one, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now, it probably helped to know what lasciviousness was, wouldn't it? Lasciviousness represents unrestrained flesh. No restraints holding back the actions of the flesh. And here Jude declares that there's coming a time men are going to creep into the church and declare a doctrine that is, that is a doctrine that is tied to the race that focuses on liberty more than restraint. Are they always as quiet in here? <laughs> <laughs> Sister God. Deep God. Is anybody bad to be here? No. Uh, Anybody have a problem with what I'm saying? If you don't say it, I'm going on anyway. <laughs> I studied this intensely. Because years ago, somebody gave me that book, Destined to Rain. And they said, this will change your life. And I love the teaching of righteousness. It changed my life. But when I read the book, the first half of the book was phenomenal. Probably the best book teaching on righteousness I'd ever read. Then I got to the second half. And then start off the second half saying, and God can no longer see your sin once you've been made righteous. 
and it, it declined from there on. And it was all predicated on now that you're a son, God, God will never turn his back on you. And it's not in the Word. Amen. Now, if we had time, I can chill it. If we had time, we could spend a week in here looking at these verses. Are you follow me? But men are going to creep in and turn the grace of God into unrestrained flesh. This isn't denying the only Lord Jesus, or the only Lord God, and our Lord Jesus Christ. They deny him. Now we think they deny him, meaning they, 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 they say he's not real. There is no Jesus. That's not what he's talking about. They're denying his lordship. Amen. 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 You can't talk about grace and then deny Jesus at the same time. They're taking Jesus and perverting the grace message. That's why I call it ludicrous grace. Because I really don't believe for very long Jesus is your Savior if He's not really truly your Lord as well. The two go together. And if you are, if you are hearing these convicting voices, you say, no, that's condemnation. You're denying His Lordship. If God can't change you, if He can't lead you. Let me give you an example of how this happens. You know, brother so and so has heard this message, and they've always kind of liked to do drugs or drink or run around anyway, and they just realize, hey, I believe in Jesus, I'm righteous. And uh, uh, so they go out and they have another party or do what they wanted to do, and they hear this voice saying, I really don't want you doing that. That's not my plan for your life. You need to, you need to endeavor to live above that sin. But they've heard that God can't see their sin. They've been told if you hear any condemnation, it's either your own soul condemning you or it's the devil. So here's the Holy Spirit trying to tell them you need to make shifts in your life. And what are they going to say? I don't receive that. That's condemnation. Get behind you, Satan. And you just call the Holy Spirit Satan. That's a dangerous place to be. And I believe you do that long enough. The Holy Spirit says you have it your way. I can do better than Burger King. <laughs> you be old enough to know what I meant by that. Right? <laughs> Have it your way. You don't want me to Lord, be Lord over your life? You don't want my guidance, leadership, and deliverance power? Then have it your way. Go right down to the pit of hell you want to go into. And God has so given you free will that you choose which way you're going to go. I heard somebody ministering here a few weeks ago. Well, I'm, not, I'm not going to it. I'm not going to it. Turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Look at verse 5. Does anybody have a problem believing that Jude was written to Christians? It says from the beginning, for those sanctified and preserved in Jesus Christ, this is written to the church. Then he, says, then he says, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them to believe not. Now why? Understand he did, right? Amen. The unbelievers died in the wilderness. Why would Jude, through the Spirit of God, alert us to the point or the fact that those that didn't believe, those that wouldn't follow God fully, right, perished in the wilderness? If it didn't apply to us today. He'd be saying, unlike those in Egypt, who perished, you won't. And we have to use our, our thinking when we read these things, right? He goes on, he says in verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, have you reserved an eternal change under darkness, under the judgment of the great day? Why is he warning us about the angels? Because he's telling us, if you fall for this lascivious grace message, you will be in the same condition as them. That's right, amen. So what the word's kind of letting us see here. Yeah. There's no word. Find me. Find me the verses in the New Testament. Show me one verse that says, because now you're a son, you can do what you want. Has anybody ever heard of the Satanic Bible? Oh, yes. Written by Antoine LeVay? Yeah. Do you know what the number one commandment in the Satanic Bible is? It says, do as thou wilt is the whole of the law. 
of Satan. Do as you want to. That's what the lascivious grace says. Do what you want. God can't see it. Just do it if he loves you. Oh, praise God that God loves me. But the Bible also says, we may not have time to get there tonight. Whom he loves, he chases. And chasing doesn't mean beat. It means to correct. He corrects every son whom he loves. But if you be without correction, what's it say? You're no longer a son. What happened to that son thing where you're always a son because God's now your father? Apparently it's only true unless he can correct you. But if you're telling the Spirit of God he's the voice of Satan, you will be rejecting that correction. Read on. Verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh or set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Why is God warning us of all this? If it's not possible, we could fall into that. He's writing this to believers. He's telling us, if we take it all back to verse 3, he's telling us to guard against letting that doctrine suddenly come in unawares. And there's a good chance you've already been, how can I say, is try to sneak in on your life. What I'm trying to do in these messages is to put within you, to embed within you an, an alarm that when you hear that what father would turn his back on someone, when you hear that an alarm goes and says, that's not in the world, and you shut down that conversation. Do you follow me? Let me ask a question. How many of you have already heard this before as far as that doctrine? You've heard people talking about it. Anybody? There's some hands going up around. Where I'm at in Kentucky, it's squeezing like wildfire fire. There are church after church raising, raising up this. And so many other churches that used to preach truth are now converting to it. It's subtly not, sometimes not so subtly coming in and it's taking over their doctrines. Now God can't see our sin anymore. And I'm telling you, it's, it's a cancer that once it creeps into a group of people, they'll no longer receive the teaching of the man of God behind the pulpit who's trying to bring correction and reproof. Because who's he to correct me? I'm not under law. I'm under grace. Praise God. You know what the grace of God is designed to do? It's designed to deliver you from sin more than it's designed just to cover your sin. The grace of God carries the power of the ability to set you free. Right. Versus just say, well, it's God made me this way. He made me like this. He gave me these tendencies. Well, all the sin will fall short of the glory of God. I hear people, you know, I don't want to get off track here, but we've been dealing with some stuff in, in our home state regarding fairness and racism, regarding trying to authenticate homosexuality as a civil right. And the argument I always hear is, God made me this way. I always say, well, God made me a liar and a thief. Or he says, I was born this way. You know, I was born this way. I said, I was born a liar and a thief. I didn't be born yet, so do you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I stand on my kid. I see my brother's bubble gun when I was, you know, five years old. <laughs> I was probably 40 or 50. I don't know. <laughs> but I've been sanctified by that. Look at verse 8. Can I keep going on this? Yes. yes. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. How do they defile the flesh? They let their bodies be used for that which is not holy. There's no restraint. Now listen, God doesn't expect perfection. He expects you targeting perfection. He expects you to do it all perfect. He expects you to want to do it all perfect. Versus say, well, I'm under grace and it doesn't matter anymore. It does matter. And when, you, when it doesn't matter, now you start to defile the flesh. They despise dominion. What's that mean, despise dominion? <coughs> they hate authority. They hate the authority of the pastor trying to tell them what they need to change. They hate the authority of the Lord Jesus trying to tell them what to change. They hate the authority of the Holy Spirit speaking in their life. And they hate about three fourths of the world, if not more. In other words, they reject it. And the correction will bring. 
And it says, and they speak evil of dignities. Now this, this, is, a, this is a word, the word dignities there. I don't understand why it's translated by that, but actually the word there is glory. It's the word dox in the Greek. They speak evil of the glory. I believe what it's talking about is because of their track, because of their path, because of their decisions, they're rejected any ability to go into the glory of God. Which is funny to me, because I'm convinced the glory of God, the kind of supernatural cloud of glory of God, whatever manifestation it takes, is actually the love of God in concentrated form. Amen? Amen. Yet hyper-verse people will tell you, I'm just walking in love, but actually it's the furthest thing from love. Otherwise, it would be aligned with the glory. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Let's read these. But the, read on. These speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally. They don't comprehend supernatural things anymore. They only speak about the flesh, about the natural, about what they want to do. As brute beasts and those things that they corrupt themselves. Woe to them! For the, and I will assure you, many of these people who's talking to, uh, woe about at one time would declare, in fact, probably still do say they're saved. They swear to you they're saved. But he says, woe to them. They have gone in the way of Cain. How many know Cain is the one that slew his brother? And ran greedily after the heir of Balaam. Balaam used his gifts in an attempt to curse Israel. For reward. And perished in the gain. He said, Korah. Korah is the one that opposed Moses. And the earth swallowed him up. This is a book of warning against this message. And I personally don't know how anybody can embrace it and read this book, this book of Jude, and still align their lives with it. But they've fallen, they've fallen prey to that one statement. What father would turn his back on a son? Apparently, they don't know some of the fathers I know. These are spots. Verse 12. These are spots for your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. No fear. What's it mean, no fear? <clears throat> no fear of God. No fear of missing God. You guys know what the fear of God is. <clears throat> Can I define for you the fear of God? For an unbeliever, the fear of God represents the fear of the judgment of God. But because you're going after the spirit and not of the flesh, the fear of God is different for you. The fear of God for me is the fear of not being in His will. My fear is the fear of not listening and hearkening what He wants me to do. A rebelling against God's word. Are you following me? They have no fear at all. They have no fear of condemnation. They have no fear of missing God. Why? Because of this grace meant mindset. They think everything's okay no matter what. And they feed with you. And act like they're one with you. I can't tell you how many people have come to my church and try to tell my people about this message. Oh yeah, we're learning at our church about this new grace revolution, this grace revelation. And it's changing our lives. And we don't have to worry about those things that, are you, that you guys do anymore. It's just legalism. Well, I know this. We pray all night every Friday night. And uh, usually we, we pray somewhere between 3 and 5 in the morning. We'll start at 11 o'clock at night. And every time we do, the supernatural power of God shows up. Vision, revelation, visitations, prophetic utterance, interpreter. We, it shows up every time. But apparently we're just talking legalism. Here we're having encounters with God. God expects us to put the flesh under to move into spiritual dominance in our lives. The flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. As long as the flesh dominates, you can't follow God like you want to follow Him. Don't tell me it's legalism. 
is discipline over the flesh. And I find that flesh is not disciplined, takes over. For example, I'm on another weight loss effort. I've lost in my life probably at least a thousand pounds. <laughs> and then I found it again. I, I know how to I know how to how I can discipline my eating to lose weight. All I gotta do is, is eat small portions, don't overeat, and don't eat late at night, and I can lose weight. And of course I cut the sugar out. I lose weight. It may take a while to lose weight. But I found it once I decide that, or I get to the weight I'm happy with or something happens, and I start drinking Pepsis again or Cokes or eating, you know, all that sinful stuff they're eating at that luncheon today. <laughs> Chocolate. I found it also starts coming back up really quickly. Because now all of a sudden, hey, I'll have a piece of cake at night. I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a jelly belly machine in my house. <laughs> it holds 480 pounds of candy. I've got 12 flavors of M&M's in it. And I found that if I wasn't disciplining myself, I'd go by, oh, hey, I haven't had any chili pepper M&M's in a while. Let's grab a handful of those. Oh, how about some hot chocolate M&M's? Have a handful of those. They say, no, I've eaten about two pounds of chocolate in a day. <laughs> handful at a time. What I lost? I lost control. And then the weight just like that again. We can't afford to be like the spiritual. Right. We've got to develop a discipline like to maintain dominance over the flesh. As long as you think it doesn't matter, flesh is going to dominate all the time. Do you see this? It says there's spots in your feast of charity, that were charity is love. And when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds are they without water. No anointing. Look at this. Carried about of winds. What winds? Whichever way the devil wants to blow on. But look at this next phrase. Trees whose fruit withereth. Now they declare they're walking in love, but fruit represents love. Fruit of the Spirit's love, right? This is theirs is withering. Why they've lost connection with the source of that which sustains our fruit. The Spirit of God energizes us to carry the love of God. Look at this. Look at this. Say, tell us, Pastor Jack. Tell us, Pastor Jack. Twice dead, this is withered, without fruit, no love, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Now, again, my background is engineering, and I'm a very logical thinker. And to me, words carry meaning. And I believe God is a logical thinker because he could not have produced this logical universe unless he was a logical thinker. He's an orderly thinker. And here the Spirit of God intentionally in this book said they are twice dead. How is somebody twice dead? Because once they were dead to sin, then they got born again and they were alive. But then through compromising their walk with God by believing grace covered everything, they lost out their sonship and they died again. Now they are twice dead. They're also physically dead because they're going to the Feast of Charity. Hard to visit a feast if you're physically dead. Amen. You surely won't eat anything. <laughs> I, like to keep, I like to keep these heavy messages somewhat, you know, infused with humor. <laughs> twice dead means they used to be saved and now they're not. Can it get any clearer? And what's the source of this? Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. It's a dangerous doctrine to start to listen to because it wants to creep in. Unawares. And you start thinking, well, I'm a son of God. You know, God does love me. I, and the worst is he loves me. Yes, he loves you. Amen? Amen. The word even says nothing can take you out of the love of God. Right? Neither height nor depth or any other creature can take you out. But you know one thing on that list? You. You can take you out. By refusing to let Jesus really be Lord. By telling the voice of the Spirit that it's really Satan. By thinking just because you believe in Jesus, it's going to be okay. 
Jesus said, Satan saw, you know, knows I'm the Lord. And I saw him fall from heaven. Apparently, Satan believes in Jesus. Is he going to heaven? No. It's not enough to believe. Can I go a couple more verses? Yes. We'll leave off the rest of this book. Look at verse 13 anyway. Raging waves of the sea. Foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars. Wandering stars. No real pastor. Oh, I don't have to belong to a church. I'm free. Really? Look at that. Uh, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Forever. It's my sound light. Twice dead, saved and not saved, and are going to darkness. That should make it clear that God can't see your sin. And if you're not willing to address it, that God's going to heal it. See this? How many want to make sure that doctrine doesn't creep into your life? Yeah. Now, there is a place to get caught up with works if you're trying to do everything to please God, trying to observe favor from God, and trying to earn God's love. We don't want to go there either. I don't want to be in religious works anymore than I want to be in religious liberty. I want to be led of the Spirit. Yeah. And I know this from, listen, my wife shares some things about her testimony, some very small things about her testimony at lunch today. She left a whole lot out, especially on her side. <laughs> we are not who we used to be. And it wasn't just because we got saved 33 years ago. It's because 33 years ago we got saved and we've continued in the Word. And we've let God transform us by the renewing of our minds by the Word of God, right? And we're afraid not to let God transform us. I would, I, would, I would not want to rebel against God's leading for my life. How about you? Uh, probably time to open these notes, huh? That was the introduction. Romans chapter 11. I'm really out of time. Let me go about one or two verses more. It'll take me more than an hour or two. And really, I've got, I've got up here bunches and bunches of verses to tell you this. I need to show you a film to you. Not tonight, but tomorrow. Romans chapter 11, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in Romans chapter 11, let me just speak to a couple of things. We're not going to take time to read the verses. He starts talking about, and Romans are written to Christians, and he's talking about how they are now branches of the tree that Israel used to be part of. That Israel, because of their rebellion against God, were broken off of the tree, and now the church has been grafted into the tree, talking about Jesus. Did you follow that? Let me state it again. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. According to John 15, right? And it says, it says in Romans 11, that Israel used to be part of the tree, but because they did not follow God, they were broken off the tree, and he grafted the church in their place to the tree. Do you see this? Well, then he says in verse 21, we'll look at verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Talking about Israel. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. There's the fear thing. How do you fear if there's no danger? I mean, it's like Pastor Bob challenged me to a game of Wars with friends. Oh, no, it's Pastor Bob. <laughs> <laughs> that was all fear there. <laughs> Challenge you to a motorcycle race? Up a mountain. Up a mountain, yeah. Getting <laughs> heels. <laughs> Listen, if, if if there's if there's nothing there to fear, why would you get 
Paul says we need to fear. Apparently there's a fear that, it, that we can lose out with these things of God. I don't want to lose out. And I'm not trying to tell you about to lose your salvation. I'm telling you, don't let the doctrine that we're not in the flesh is allowed to dominate your life. Be not high minded to fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, talking about Israel, take heed that he also spare not thee. Oh, apparently, according to Paul, the one with the revelation of righteousness, he's the one that wrote Corinthians about how we've been made righteous. Apparently, we can be cut off. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. Praise God for God's goodness toward me. He's wrapping me into the tree. Are you happy about that? Yes. If. Oh, man. That word if is powerful. <laughs> Two letters, I if. It could be I flunked. <laughs> <laughs> Two letters if turn a promise of God into a conditional promise. Is this okay? Amen. He says, goodness toward the if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Now what do the hyper priests do with, with the book of Romans? There's, there, you, you have a few verses you're allowed to read, and the rest of it is legalism. It can produce condemnation. And apparently, it was missing. I've now heard, again, there's a, there's a well-known man of God who will say it here tonight. It's actually declared that in the Gospels, Jesus made an error in some of his statements. And at one time, I considered the premier Bible teacher in the world that's now fallen for this doctrine. Now I declare that Jesus erred in some of his statements. That's serious stuff. Yeah, Jesus misspoke. <laughs> you may tell you why people fall for this? Because they wanted to fall for sin and this gave them a way to do it. Yes. I don't want to fall for sin. I want, I want to fall for God. Yes. You know, all the way in love with Him. Yes. Otherwise, be cut off. Hebrews chapter 10. We'll cease here. Maybe. You know what it means when a preacher says they're closing, right? No. <laughs> now this is an amazing statement for me. Verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some, is but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And, and apparently, the closer we get to the return of Christ, the more people want to not come to church. That assembling together is talking about the church. <coughs> and follow on this. That word assembly doesn't mean just to gather. I, I, I've worked in, in different factories. We have Caterpillar up here, right? Mm -hmm. And they assemble at the equipment. People bring different components, they put it together, and each piece has its position. It's fitted in, bolted in, fastened in, welded in, and it's assembled. The church is not just to gather, it's to be assembled. Everybody bringing what God's given them with to use it for the purpose of the kingdom of God. So this is don't forsake that. We should not be avoiding going to church. Yet I hear a lot of people and I say, well, I'm righteous. And I don't go to church. I'm just part of the church. We'll just write this verse out as well. Do you see this? Yes. Well, what I want you to see is the next verse. Look at this, verse 26. Four. Now, four is like if. It's some little conditional word, right? For if we sin willfully... After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Apparently there's a place where you decide to settle for sin. I'm not talking about eating that other piece of chocolate cake. 
Oh, and the Holy Spirit called, told me not to eat that cake, and I ate it anyway. Oh, Lord, don't take thy Holy Spirit from me. Uh, don't let me fall short of thy glory. I ate too much chocolate cake. I'd have been thrown in the hill years ago just because I ate the wrong thing. <laughs> We'd all fallen on that one, right? I'm not talking about that. Sinning willfully is you're doing something that's major, intentionally. And then maybe you think later you can just repent and will. Can I give an example of this? Am I going too long? Are you ready to sleep on me? No. Test the Bob Brack Red Bull before you can't sleep stay away. <laughs> Pastor Obalos to counsel, I tolerate. <laughs> Years ago I was counseling a couple. And they were both single. They were dating. And somehow they kept falling into bed together. Falling into couch, falling into wherever they were. <laughs> and they came to my office, they wanted to talk to me. And they said, we, we just want to come to you and tell you that, you know, uh, we messed up. But uh, praise God, we, we, we repent and we're righteous. And I uh, said, so well, praise God, because I knew some other stuff. Spiritual <coughs> and I could tell some things. I said, you know, you can't just do these things and then declare your righteous later and say, well, we repent. In other words, we apologized. To repent means to turn away from it. They said, well, we're the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't work like that. If you genuinely repent, you are. But if you're planning these things, it becomes intentional and now you're, you're taking God for a sucker. So I said, I said, I said to the couple, I said, well, how many times have you had to repent for this already? And the guy says, well, I don't feel like sitting here business. I think, well, you came to me for counsel. <laughs> how many times has this happened? He said, I, you know, it's none of your business. She said, five times. Hey, five times? It's no longer an accident. <laughs> You're like we were when we were kids. We would go swim in a creek, and Mom said no. So we thought it would be close enough we could slide, and it was an excuse. I said, I fell in, Mom. Really? I so much as slipped in. I spent an hour in the water here trying to wash off the mud. <laughs> Gosh, y'all got quiet. Remember, I'm a repentance line up here in a minute. Amen. If we sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice. I don't, I, I understand you mess up. Maybe you. You, you fell into you know into the sack with somebody, or you, you know you, you you did something really bad wrong. There is a place of repentance. I believe God's always willing to forgive. Amen. So don't claim for an idiot. Amen. Do you follow me? Yeah. Don't think you just do it on purpose. Well, I'll just repent later. <clears throat> that is premeditated sin. Thinking you have a get out of jail free card. Mm -hmm. Let me make it clear again. If you made a mistake. Go to God and say, God, I made a mistake. Forgive me. He's right there saying, it's done. Amen. It's done. Now come after me. But you can't go say, oh, I made a mistake, God. I'm going to do it again next week. Can you just go? We have another court next week because I'll be repenting next week for the same thing. You have repented. Amen. Amen. You're planning. Now here's what's interesting. Four is a conditional word. Four is a word. So I want to know what is the woeful sin he must refer to. I go back a verse. For we forsake the gathering ourselves together. Apparently, not allowing yourself to be used in church, quickened in church, as we've been learning, to God is willful sin. Man. God puts a high priority on us giving our gifts into the kingdom of God to be used in the church. Amen. Then he goes on, he says in verse 27. But a fearful, a certain fearful looking for judgment, for judgment, and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Uh, how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he is sanctified an unholy thing? And, and has done the spike under the spirit of grace. Shall I, shall I paraphrase that for you? If the people of Israel 
died in the wars for rebelling against Moses? How much more if we think we can just claim the blood of Christ covers our sins when we're doing it intentionally? It doesn't work. And apparently, God's declaring if you sin willfully in these things, you're you're trampling on the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. And apparently, you lose out in your sonship. Now, we've only covered about three or four verses on this, including Jude. So we've already started. We'll finish. We'll work on this more and more. If Pastor Mike gives me permission. Otherwise, we'll bring a happy message. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus loves me this. <laughs> Apparently, we cannot fall for that trap. Because your sons, what father would turn his back on a son? Because I've only covered a few verses. Again, I've probably got 30 or 40 or 50 of them here. It doesn't line up with the word. Thank you for letting me share with you.